Kristalina, thank you so much for joining CNBC. I want to kick off by just getting a sense from you. Um, 340 billion, that's what the UN says that essentially we're going to need to be contributing to developing nations in mm -hmm. order for them to adapt to climate change. But how can you ask struggling economies at this point to help those that are most vulnerable when they've become vulnerable themselves? The uh, importance of mobilizing for adaptation is so obvious when you're in, on the African continent. Uh, countries here have contributed 3% of global emissions, but they're disproportionately uh, impacted. And why it is in, in, in the interest of the advanced economies to support them? Two reasons. One, stability. If we are to allow climate shocks time and again to devastate poor countries, we contribute to instability that Europe feels very strongly, especially when my, migration flows uh, increase. And two, markets. If you want to have your economies export to these countries, uh, there has to be uh, prosperity and stability there. Uh, you talked about the financing uh, gap. We would never close it if we rely on the generosity of rich countries because it is too big to be close with public money. So most important, here and in the months to follow, is to work relentlessly to create opportunities for private investments to take place in the developing world. Many would argue that adaptation is not attractive for private flows. True for some parts of it, for example, if you are to uh, build a protective uh, wall, uh, that has to be done by the public, but not true if you talk about climate resilient agriculture and ability to move from low to higher value added uh, products on the agricultural chain. Yeah. So we have to work harder yeah. to get money flowing to developing countries. It's tough to work harder when uh, so many of the CEOs are just not showing up this year. Uh, mm -hmm. When you think about that uh, and the health of the global economy, how would you gauge it at this point? because they're back at home worried about shareholders mm -hmm. and worried about liquidity. So uh, many are very uh, traumatized by the fact that we are uh, moving towards a very difficult 2023. We don't even know what to think about 2024 as of now. But let's remember that there is bad news. Yes, tough times and tougher times ahead. There is also good news for the green transition. We are forced by high energy prices to be more energy efficient. And this higher energy fuel, uh, fossil fuel based prices also make renewables more competitive. And I actually believe that we are at the point of uh, tango when we are making one step backwards because of the tough economic environment but we are going to make two steps forward uh, on the green transition because of this economic logic. We are forced to move faster. It's fascinating if you're watching the markets right now, you're seeing energy stocks performing better than in pretty much every other sector. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's become um, pretty obvious to those who watch oil and gas that we need more investment. Mm -hmm. People at home even have begun to understand that, and not just because of the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. also because that energy crisis that we're moving towards mm -hmm. due to a lack of investment has finally um, become apparent. Mm -hmm. Do you worry that there is going to be backlash from countries that are hurting over this winter and hurting next winter? I'm talking about Western economies. We are going to see a very difficult uh, uh, 2023. Why? Because you look back, shock upon shock upon shock that has exhausted public buffers. And you look forward, US slowing down because of high interest rates to fight inflation, and that has to be the priority. Yeah. Uh, Europe, half of it likely in recession in uh, 2023, maybe even more. China slowing down. That inevitably creates a very difficult environment 
uh, for next year. Where we have to uh, zero in on though is awareness of the risks of climate change are particularly high among younger people. When you survey youth anywhere in the United States, in India, in Europe, in China, the desire to see action is through the roof. Now, the, the more we go into time that young people... They're not necessarily the tax-paying public, though, are they? The, the more we move into the time that they become the tax-paying public, the more we would feel it in, in pressures. Yeah. Uh, and in meanwhile, the only hope I have is for us, our generation, uh, to recognize that uh, climate change is real. It is very destruct destructive uh, for our economies. It actually is potentially even a bigger risk to supply chains than what we have seen with uh, COVID. And it has to be taken seriously. Now, what are the levers we have? One, put every business on equal footing. That means that carbon intensive businesses have to be recognizing that uh, they impose a cost on the pu public, on public health, and of course uh, on the disruptions we see from, uh, from climate. We have been advocating for using whatever is appropriate. In some countries there is tax, mm. in some countries there is trade, yeah. In some countries, like the United States, there are regulations that move uh, more uh, climate-friendly uh, uh, businesses uh, Do you forward. think that a windfall tax on the massive profits we've seen oil companies accruing is the way forward? Actually, uh, when, whenever you put a post-factum uh, tax, you distort the policy environment. Uh, if you want investments to happen, the investment climate has to be one based on predictability. Yeah. What we are much more interested in is a recognition that there has to be more progressivity in uh, taxation, like dividend taxation, uh, uh, private income, because over the last years, inequalities have grown, and that is not healthy uh, for societies. It undermines the foundation for growth uh, and we also are very much in favor of this equal footing. Put everybody on the same page, so internalize that uh, cost that companies impose on society through uh, carbon uh, emissions. It sounds as if you're advocating, frankly, for a more realistic approach from those here at COP27 when they talk about the energy dynamics that the world actually needs, not just to continue hopefully growing economies and getting the world's economy generally back on track, mm. but also in terms of getting to that transition. Is that a message you think that they should send to, frankly, the fossil fuel community, which is we need to have a plan going forward to work with you? This is exactly the message. We have to recognize that uh, we are way behind where we should be to protect the well-being of our children. If you look at the, this decade, the 2020 to 2030, we have to cut emissions by somewhere between 25 and 50 percent, and emissions are still growing. Yeah. Why we should worry? Well, you don't have to look any further than what happened this, uh, this summer uh, in uh, the United States, in Europe, everywhere. We should worry because Mother Nature is telling us, yeah. stop. Yeah. Before I let you go, Egypt, over the last decade or so, they've had $75 billion or more contributed, not just by the IMF, obviously, but Gulf Arab nations as well. When you take a step back and look at the progress that's been made, particularly under President Sisi, would it be wrong to look at this and say it feels as if Egypt's just too big to fail? Mm. Well, Egypt is doing uh, uh, quite a lot in comparison to where it was, uh, say, 2014, 2015. Uh, there has been a focus on two sets of reforms. One on gradually improving investment climate and opening up more opportunities for private investments getting the state to gradually pull back from a disproportionately large share in the economy to social protection, target vulnerable people, 
support households, uh, and also support vulnerable businesses. Yeah. And I must say that I look at uh, what uh, Egypt uh, has achieved uh, with admiration, because it's not an easy uh, task uh, uh, for the country. Of course, it has to do more. And I see tremendous opportunities for Egypt the more it makes itself an investment destination mm -hmm. at the time of recognizing that like global really supply, supporting the private sector in a way we really haven't supporting seen. the private sector because what we know is uh, uh, fragmentation uh, in the world means yeah. that supply chains have to diversify you cannot rely on only one source no more we take cost as the only decision making ingredient yeah. security matters a country like egypt that that has uh, stability and opens up true reforms uh, more opportunities for private sector can be a natural destination for those thinking how to diversify uh, their, their supply chains chris Selena, thank you for joining cnbc thank you